There was nothing youthful about us except our actions. Three grown men acting like a bunch of teenagers. It was a bad situation and we tried our best not to let it consume us. It's easy to become bitter and vindictive when your wife cheats on you. It takes self-control not to explode. As long as the three of us were together, we could support each other. So, which of our wives cheated? All of them. All this happened within six months. My wife Loretta jumped into action and had no problem getting Dora and Colleen to join her. By the time the three of us realized what was happening, it was too late to save any marriages. None of us were interested in trying. Tonight everything fell into place. Surprisingly, neither of the wives suspects that we know what the hell is going on. We've spent the last month preparing and we're really excited to make it work. Woody, Terry, and I grew up together. We were born and raised in Womelsdorf and originally planned to retire here. Unfortunately, everything changed when the wives went crazy. Tomorrow we are leaving for our new life in Canada. Tonight we would have had our last juvenile romance. Why youthful? Well, what we planned was childish and inappropriate. We preferred this to cruelty and vindictiveness. It was Terry's idea to go to Canada. The three of us went fishing there every summer. We always had a great time and often talked about how great it would be to live there permanently. Of course, we were all married and had children. Both of my daughters got married and moved away. Terry had a son who served in the Air Force. Woody had two sons in college and a 17-year-old daughter, Caitlin, still living at home. Caitlin would have been a problem until Woody found out that she was aware of what her mother was doing. She threatened to leave if he didn't do anything about it. As a result, three guys and one purposeful teenage girl went to Canada. It was difficult for a while, but we all agreed that we could still make it work. Terry was the chef. In fact, he was a cook. He had no formal education, just a lot of experience. For the last 10 years, he and Dora owned a small family restaurant. Well, they actually had a restaurant until Terry sold it last week without Dora's knowledge. I'm not sure how he pulled it off, but he walked away with $100,000 in cash. When he added that to all the money he had withdrawn from the bank and cashed out on insurance policies, we had a pretty good startup package. Woody owned an auto repair shop with his brother Glenn. Glenn had been trying to buy out Woody's share for years, so that was another easy hundred thousand for us. He got almost half that for his 1964 vet. Today he cleaned out all his bank accounts. I was the only one in the whole group who went to college. I didn't have a business like the other guys, but I had over a quarter of a million dollars in investments. I was earning a good salary as an electrical engineer and investing wisely. Even in a bad market, I was able to stand my ground. It took a couple of weeks to clean up, but it was all done now. So, in total, we had about a million dollars. Our initial goal was to purchase a fishing lodge. But at some point we relented and settled on one where our guests could arrive by car. It ended up costing us almost $500,000, but we were happy. We had enough cash left over to get started and support ourselves for at least four years. If we made money, everything would be even better. We all packed our things and were ready. Tomorrow morning, a caravan of three cars set off for a new life in the northern woods. Wow, that sounded about as exciting as Little House on the Prairie. Loretta worked in the claims department of one of the major insurance companies in the area. Somehow she became close with her boss, Raymond Upright. To meet Raymond in the evenings, she persuaded Dora and Colleen to fill in for her. The girls would go out for dinner and drinks together, or to some house party, so that Loretta would have the opportunity to meet Raymond at his house. This went on for a couple of months, and then Raymond set up a date with Colleen. The girls didn't want to leave Dora unattended, so a couple of weeks later she also got a permanent chaperone. So, as it stands, every Wednesday night the girls hang out while the guys play poker. The three ladies and their lovers spent time at Raymond's country house. We never found out if any exchange took place, but it didn't seem to matter. Woody chose the Holiday Inn as his meeting place. We waited at home until the wives went for an evening walk. For some reason, each of them arrived in their own car. I think this was in case one of them wanted to leave early or stay late. Caitlin wasn't happy about having to wait for us at the motel, but we couldn't risk taking her with us. We weren't planning anything particularly complicated, but we could still run into problems. 
Woody and Terry were planning to go straight back to the Holiday Inn, so they went together. I wanted to see Loretta one last time before leaving, so I took my car. There were six cars parked in front of the upright house. It seemed like everyone was driving on their own. About half an hour after we got there, the light in one of the bedrooms came on and then went out again. Soon after, the same thing happened in the other two bedrooms. We each had a set of side-cutting pliers. It took less than two minutes to cut all the valve stems on, each machine. I had surveyed the house a week earlier so I knew exactly where the electrical service box was. The individual switches were inside, but the main panel was outside, just above the meter. While I was climbing into the house, Terry and Woody were preparing smoke bombs. Terry built ten smoke bombs using PVC pipe. I don't know what was in them except saltpeter and sugar. Terry tested them and they burned for twenty to thirty minutes. They were big dupes. Woody walked around the back of the house and Terry walked around the front. When I saw the first wisp of white smoke, I pressed the main power switch. Using my tools, I opened the box and pulled out the main switch. By the time I got to the car, all ten smoke bombs were working at full power. Most of them were white, but a few were orange and red. When we left, the house was completely enveloped in smoke. On the way home, I used my phone to call two local television stations. At least an hour had passed when I heard a car door slam in front of the house. Loretta looked like shit when she walked into the house. I sat in front of the turned-off TV with a beer. It wasn't cold because I had been holding it in my hand for the last half hour. How was your evening, dear? She put down her purse and kicked off her shoes. I had to take a taxi home. The car has a flat tire. Why didn't you call me? There was no answer. Do you want me to go pick up your car? No, I'll take care of it in the morning. I'm tired. I need to take a shower and I want to go to bed. Loretta, where are your earrings? You wore diamond earrings when you left the house. Her hand rose to her ear and her mouth opened slightly. I expected her to say that they were in her purse, but she didn't say anything. Let me guess. You took them off so as not to lose them in bed. You left your purse in the living room, so you had to put your earrings on the nightstand. When the lights went out, you forgot your earrings in your rush to get out of the house. This is all? She looked at me questioningly. How did you know that the lights went out? I picked up the main switch that I had taken out of the box. Oh, God, no. You were there. Please, John, don't tell me you were there. I smiled and got up from the chair. I was not alone. Terry and Woody were with me. We'll leave in the morning. We bought a shrimp boat in Bayou La Batra, Alabama. I hope you and Raymond will be very happy. John, wait. Don't go. John, can we talk? John. I slammed the door behind me and walked to the car. I passed the upright on the way to the motel. There were a couple of black and whites and four tow trucks trying to get cars out of there. I parked down the street and walked straight into the garage. Nobody tried to stop me. The house was dark and empty. I used a mini flashlight to check the bedrooms. In the second, I found a pair of diamond earrings along with both of Loretta's engagement rings. I found it interesting that she actually removed her rings before committing adultery. Ten minutes later, I was at the Holiday Inn. Loretta called the other wives and they desperately tried to work things out. According to Terry, Dora cried so hysterically that he could not understand a word she was saying. He turned off his phone. Colleen, on the other hand, wasn't as emotional. All she did was demand that Woody come home immediately and explain himself. He also turned off his phone. We booked one room with two double beds. Caitlin wasn't thrilled about sleeping in a room with three guys, but it was added at the last minute, so she had to endure it. We slept in our clothes and hit the road at five in the morning the next day. We had a room booked for the next night at Plattsburgh. Woody promised Caitlin that she would have her own room. We had been on the road for about five hours when my cell phone rang. I forgot to turn it off. Collar ID showed it was my eldest daughter, Sarah. Dad, this is Sarah. What's going on between you and Mom? Is she there? Yes, and she is desperate. She said you won't let her explain anything. Did she explain this to you? No, she simply said that you are being unreasonable and unfair. 
that's all I can get out of her. I Sarah, do me a favor. See if your mother wears wedding rings. There was a short pause. No. What does it mean? Ask her where her wedding rings are? I heard a few muffled sounds, and then Sarah returned. Dad, what the hell is going on? I asked about her rings, and she burst into tears and ran out of the house. She drove away, but I didn't recognize the car she was driving. When your mother is ready to tell you what happened, I will talk to you. Until then, I really have nothing more to say. I'll stop by her house later today. I turned off my phone. I didn't need to call anyone anymore. At noon today, each of the wives will be served with divorce papers. Raymond Upright will receive divorce papers, as will Carl Wilcox and Dennis Roswell. Our mutual lawyer, Seymour Schlump, promised to keep us updated if he had a chance to contact us. Seymour went to school with us and was proud to be part of our revenge efforts. In fact, this is not revenge, but simply a way to get away from the problem. Two days later, we settled into our new home. I hope our wives expected us to go to Alabama. It would be easier if no one was looking for us. Terry was delighted with the kitchen, his new empire. The lodge closed for two weeks to allow us to familiarize ourselves with the situation. At this time, several old employees visited us. Woody had his hands full. Between the start of the boat's engines and the hum of the lodge's generators, he had very little free time. Caitlin agreed to wait tables and keep the house, but since she wasn't co-owner, she wanted to be paid. How could we refuse? By the time our first guest arrived, we had everything ready. Terry planned the menu and stocked the pantry. Woody tuned all the boat motors. The general management of the establishment fell on my shoulders. I liked this challenge. Experienced local fishing guides eagerly awaited guests. What they prepared depended on how successful their trip was. We didn't have to worry about that. Whenever I had the opportunity, I worked on the lodge's website. The better the website, the easier it will be to keep rooms occupied. Terry, Woody, and I were fishermen. When fall came, we had to start providing services to people who were interested in hunting or anything else. At that moment, we had no idea what we were going to do. We decided to cross this bridge when we came to it. Things were going great at the lodge. At home, things were different. Seymour called to give us the latest news. Dora was the only one of the wives to sign and return the divorce papers. She didn't want a divorce, but she felt obligated to do everything Terry asked her to do. However, she became a recluse. She stayed at home most of the time and refused to talk to anyone. Colleen disappeared along with Dennis Roswell. Seymour couldn't even serve them. Nobody knew where she was. Seymour saved the worst news for last. Loretta refused to sign the divorce papers, and Raymond Upright moved into her house, to our house. So much for the repentant wife. I was useless at the lodge for the next few days. Finally, Woody and Terry sat me down and insisted that I go home and straighten things out. I didn't wait until the morning. I woke up in the middle of the night and drove south. It wasn't fair to the guys if I didn't do my part. I had to fix everything. Of course, I shit myself about halfway through. I'm not a marathon runner. I rented a small room and called Seymour. I told him to sue Continental Paragon for a million dollars with a settlement clause. If they fire both Loretta and Raymond, I'll drop the lawsuit. Seymour complained a little because he knew which option they would choose and saw big money flying out the window. I told him to bill me for my time and hand over the paperwork tomorrow at noon. I got up early and hit the road. By eight o'clock, I was sitting opposite the house, out of sight. Ten minutes later, the garage door opened and Loretta and Raymond drove off to work together. It looked natural and it made me angry. It's time for some more youthful antics. I went to Kroger and bought half a dozen cans of red beets and a pack of rubber gloves. By that time, my favorite eastern market had opened. The first purchase was five kilograms of what is commonly called stinky tofu. I bought five packages of frozen skinny fish in the frozen food section. I don't know what it's actually called. We bought it as fish bait because it smelled terrible. We just called her skinny. The last thing I bought was a couple of durian fruits. The durian fruit is considered the most foul-smelling food in the world. I was confident that I could figure out how to use it. 
Thirty minutes later, I returned to my old house. I figured I had about three hours to do what needed to be done. The first step was to use the skinny before it started to thaw. All I needed was a regular screwdriver. I went from room to room and removed the covers from every electrical switch and outlet. I threw two fish into the wall behind each device. It took me about ten minutes to complete each room. After an hour and a half, I ran out of fish. The sticky tofu was soft and mushy. It spread like butter. I have used it on the top and bottom of mattresses and on all furniture cushions. The smell permeated the fabric and was impossible to remove. I had to use a kitchen knife to cut the durian into pieces. Wow, he smells rotten. I stuck a piece deep into each of the heating and air conditioning ducts in the house. I walked around to inspect my work. I carefully screwed up all the electrical appliances so they couldn't figure out where the smell was coming from. Pleased with my efforts, I sprinkled red beet juice on every carpet in every room. No stain remover can remove it. I'm done in the house. Before leaving, I went into the garage and opened the breaker panel. I removed each switch and then the main one. I pulled out the panel and used my trusty screwdriver to unscrew each connection. It was a real nightmare for electricians, especially since I took the panel and switches with me. My work here is finished. Now they can take the house. In 30 minutes, all hell will break loose at the Continental Paragon. It was time to leave. For some reason, I felt I had to stop and see Dora. She let me into the house and offered me coffee. I felt obliged to accept the invitation. She asked how Terry was doing, but didn't ask anything else. We sat in silence until I finished my coffee. I asked her if there was anything I could do for her. She burst into tears and left the room. As I approached the door, she called out to me. John, tell him for me. Please tell him. Should I tell him what? She came back crying again. It was difficult for me to understand her. I didn't slept with him, John. Tell Terry I didn't slept with Carl. I did some other things, but I didn't sleep with him. What do you mean by other things? You know. He continued to harass me. I had to do something to make him stop. I didn't even want to be there. Colleen and Loretta made me go. They thought that if I did it too, I wouldn't say anything. I felt trapped. I just stood there. I didn't know what to say. Please, John, tell Terry I didn't sleep with him. I love Terry, and I regret letting Colleen and Loretta talk me into going with them. I do not know what to do. Help me, John. I felt worse than before I came. I nodded to her and left. She sincerely repented of what she had done, but did not know how to fix it. Before heading back, I stopped to see Sarah. She no longer spoke to her mother. Loretta didn't tell her what happened, but somehow she found out. When Sarah confronted Loretta, there was an argument that had not yet been resolved. Another damn disaster. I was close to Plattsburgh because my cell phone rang. It was Loretta. Sarah must have given her my number. John, you son of a bitch. What the hell have you done? Can you be a little more specific? I was fired today. They said they had to either fire me or go to court. Your name was mentioned. This is terrible, dear. I was hoping they were just paying me a million dollars. I think we both lost. It was hard not to laugh. That's not all. When I returned home, I found the house destroyed. There was no electricity, and the smell was simply disgusting. What have you done to my house? This is not your house, Loretta. You refuse to sign the divorce papers. This is our house. It's as much mine as it is yours, and I can do whatever I want with it. I called the police. You'll have to pay to have it fixed and have the charges dropped. Why don't you just ask Raymond to fix it? He seems to handle things better than me. He would be glad to talk to you about it, John, especially since you got him fired, too. I'll tell you what, Loretta. Next time I'm in town, I'll give him a call. The conversation was becoming a little redundant. I was glad to hear that everything went well, but I really didn't want to talk to her anymore. I never bothered to say goodbye and just turned off the phone. I hoped to be back at the lodge in time for breakfast. Everything went smoothly while I was away, except for one small problem. Caitlin, where the hell is your father? Hello, John. Welcome back. Dad will only be gone for a couple of days. He had a little problem he had to solve in Vegas. Yes, he had to borrow some cash for the trip. He asked me to tell you not to worry. 
How much cash does he have? Ten thousand. Why the hell does he need ten thousand dollars? I'm not sure, but I think it has something to do with my mother. Oh shit, where's Terry? In the kitchen, preparing for dinner. Well, other than the fact that one of the partners ran away with a large portion of our operating capital, everything seemed to be fine. Terry was busy, but seemed to have everything under control. He realized that it was easier to serve a small buffet every day than to allow guests to order from a menu. It worked for him, and there were no complaints from residents. John, welcome back. How are you traveling? It was actually a lot of fun. I was glad I went. I think you know Woody's gone? Caitlin told me briefly about it, but she didn't seem to know much. Colleen's in trouble. She called Seymour and asked if he could contact Woody. Looks like Dennis ran away from her after racking up a hefty hotel bill. At the hotel, she was arrested for defrauding the hotel owner. The bill was just under 10000 They are holding her in the local jail until the bill is paid. She faces some jail time if nothing is done soon. You're not saying that Woody is going to use our money to pay a hotel bill for Colleen and her boyfriend? I don't think so. He smiled as he left. He might have something up his sleeve. God, I really hope so. We may need this money for the winter. He bought a round-trip ticket and should return this evening. I turned to leave when I remembered my visit to Dora. Terry, I saw Dora when I was at home. She's not doing well. Oh, shit. After what they did to us, I have no sympathy for her or the others. I'm not sure, but I think things could have been different with Dora. Differently? How? A traitor is a traitor. You can't fix this. Loretta and Colleen may have pressured her to join them. I don't think she wanted it, but she felt forced into it. Is that what she told you? Not really, but she wanted me to be sure to tell you that she didn't sleep with that guy. Then what the hell was she doing there? I didn't answer him. There was a brief pause in the conversation before he began to put two and two together. Oh, shit. Don't tell me. It's great. Just great. She said she felt like she had to do something. She insisted that I tell you that she didn't sleep with him. Apparently, Loretta and Colleen really pushed her. I could tell Terry was upset. I'm sorry, John, but as far as I'm concerned, what she did was as bad as sleeping with him. She shouldn't have been there at all. I left him to think alone. I think I understood what was going on in his head, but I have to admit that I didn't know what I would have done under the same circumstances. It only took me a few hours to finish the day's work. I needed to figure out how we could make money during the winter months. We closed the fishing season, but we needed a little more. We were not interested in competing with hunting camps and unanimously rejected anything that had to do with snowmobiles. My research was interrupted by a new guest. Amanda Fries was an amazing woman. God, that was a corny line. I kicked myself for even thinking about it. She was over 40. She had short dark hair and a permanent tan. She was not a beauty, but her posture and demeanor made up for it. I assume you're the new owner? One of them. How can I help you? I can take care of myself quite well. I'm Amanda Fries. I have been coming here regularly for the past few years and hope to continue to do so. I hope you haven't changed too much because I hate change. If there are any changes that you don't like, just let me know. I will do it, I assure you. I felt like she was trying to tease me a little, but I wasn't sure of her purpose. It was my responsibility to make her happy, but I wasn't going to let her bully me. Luke Boudreaux was my constant guide. I assume it's still available? Undoubtedly. I'm going to spend the rest of the day getting settled in today. Can you make sure Luke will be here in the morning? No problem, Miss Freeze. Luke Boudreaux was more than happy to tell me about Amanda Freeze. For some reason, she liked him. He was no better or worse than the other guides, but he refused to listen to her chatter. He said she seemed to like it. The only thing that interested her was pike fishing. It was strange because she came from Burlington. In Lake Lake Champagne, there were a lot of likes. She had no reason to come to us herself. Luke wasn't sure, but he thought she was divorced. She had a son who only went on one trip with her. He hated spending time at the lake, so she never took him with her. 
She tipped big and seemed to be Luke's favorite guest. Pike fishing was an unusual choice for a woman. It wasn't exactly exciting. Hooking and landing a pike is like catching a log. She never bought any of them. It was strictly catch and release. There was something mesmerizing about her. I was looking forward to her staying with us. Somewhere in the middle of the night, Woody returned. When I came down the stairs, he was half finished with his breakfast and seemed glad to see me. Tell me the bad news, Woody. How much did your trip to Vegas end up costing us? Woody laughed quietly as Caitlin poured me a cup of coffee. Not a cent, buddy. Not a damn cent. You seem to be in a good mood. I didn't expect this. I paid for the ticket myself, John. Round-trip tickets for Las Vegas excursions are quite cheap. I took a wad of cash with me to show Colleen off. It worked perfectly. What worked? Woody finished his meal and pushed his plate aside. They held Colleen until she could pay the hotel bill she and the idiot didn't pay. He ran away from her, but she wasn't smart enough to understand what was happening. When she pays $9,700 plus court costs, she will be released. I showed her the money and promised to take care of everything as soon as she signed the divorce papers. I've never seen her act so quickly. I thought you said it didn't cost us anything. John, I'm not that stupid. I took the signed papers and walked straight out of the courthouse. I'm sure it was several hours before she realized I had fooled her as much as Dennis had. I mailed the signed papers to Seymour and boarded the next plane back to Montreal. You're a nasty son of a bitch, Woody. Yes, I know, and I feel great. When Caitlin came over to pour me coffee, I asked her to bring me something for breakfast. She said it would take a while because Terry had left. So what the hell is going on? Caitlin was better in the kitchen than I was, so I helped wait tables so she could focus on cooking. Fortunately, the breakfast crowd dispersed within a few hours. I cleaned up the kitchen while Caitlin did all the housework. The buffet lunch was a little more relaxed. It was easier to be a food server than a waiter. Caitlin again did a great job preparing the food. There was no doubt that we needed more help. Luke Boudreaux was waiting for me in my office after lunch. This was not a good sign because I didn't want to lose him as a guide. Mr. Mercer, I just need a minute of your time. Is something wrong, Luke? If so, I will do everything in my power to fix it. It's okay, but I'm worried about Miss Amanda. How concerned are you? She asks a lot of questions. She never does that. She gets mad at me because I can't answer most of them. I don't want her to be mad at me. What kind of questions? Mostly about you and why you bought the house. She asked me where you were from and about your wife. I can't answer any of these questions. She's never done this before? Hell no. She had never even spoken to me before, except about Pike. Anything else? She asked a lot of questions about the young girl, the one who runs the household. Caitlin? Why would she ask about her? Luke simply shrugged. He felt awkward about the whole situation. So I thanked him, and he quickly left. He seemed calm and satisfied with the conversation. Woody took care of dinner. He set up several grills on the front porch, and we asked all the guests to cook their own steaks. The weather was cool and balmy, but everyone seemed to be enjoying it, even Amanda Freeze. The beans, coleslaw, and garlic toast were an easy addition. Woody and Caitlin were clearing the table, and I noticed Amanda Freezy sitting by the fireplace with a glass of red wine. It wasn't really cold enough to have a good fire, but the little fireplace looked nice. May I join you? She didn't say anything, but moved on the couch to make more room. This was a good sign. I had no idea what I was going to say next. Did Luke come to see you? She was expecting my visit. Did you tell him? Actually, no, but... I did recharge the pump a little, so to speak. Did you lure him? Somewhat. It became obvious that Luke knew no more about you and your staff than I did. I wouldn't feel comfortable approaching you directly, so I hoped that he might interest you enough to come to me. Are you a very insidious woman? Is there a purpose to your madness? She finished her wine and laughed a little. I held out my hand for the empty glass, which she readily handed over to me. A few moments later, I returned with a bottle and two glasses. Now that you no longer feel awkward, 
Are there any questions you would like answered? Some. I'll make a deal with you. I can ask you a question for everyone you ask me. This is unfair. I have a right to privacy, but you don't. Would you rather just sit here and enjoy the wine and the fire? No, I want some answers. You know how to argue. Yes, it is. Are you married? Not fair. You asked the question when I wasn't looking. I don't know if it was the wine or the banter, but we both felt comfortable. I'm married, or should I say I was. I am currently in the process of getting a divorce. She nodded when I answered and took a sip of wine. My turn. Are you divorced? You asked this question the other way around. Yes, I know. I'm an optimist. I've been divorced for nine years, and I have an 18-year-old son. I have two daughters. They got married and moved away. I did not ask. I foresaw it. It was a strange conversation, and it went on for over an hour. I was forced to open another bottle of wine before we finished. Amanda finally apologized because Luke was waiting for her at 6 a.m., and she proudly announced that she was never late. I was looking forward to spending more time with her. The next morning brought several unexpected surprises. Woody and I went down to breakfast together and were surprised that our new waitress was none other than Dora. Woody and I smiled at each other and wished her good morning. Neither of us made any witty remarks and tried our best to act as if nothing unusual was happening. At some point I caught Dora looking at me and she silently said, Thank you. I simply nodded. Later that morning, Seymour called. Loretta agreed to sign the divorce papers with one condition. She wanted to be free of all responsibilities associated with the house and for me to become the sole owner. The house was trashed, but it still had good bones. I told him to agree. I was 900 kilometers away, but I was sure that I could come up with something. It was nice to see the positive results of a silly, childish prank. What really struck me was that she didn't try to get her hands on any of the assets she had accumulated. She only knew about half of them. But it was strange that she was more than willing to leave without demanding anything. Terry poked his nose into the office and winked at me. But that was it. He was a better person than me, and I was pleased for him. Amanda Freese took the day off from fishing. She was in the main lodge with Caitlin. I checked in with them several times, trying to figure out what was going on. At times, Caitlin seemed a little flustered with the older woman, indicating that they disagreed about something, but she didn't leave. I had a hard time concentrating for the rest of the day. I wanted to talk to Terry to find out what happened, which brought him and Dora together again. I was hoping to chat with Luke for a bit to see if the mysterious Mrs. Freeze had said anything during her morning fishing trip. What was going on between Amanda and Caitlin? I was dying to call Loretta just to let her vent a little and quietly gloat. I was sure Dora wanted to talk to me, but it wasn't obvious. Damn it. I was turning into the busiest person in the world. Suddenly I found myself laughing at the stupidity of it all. Woody came in with a couple of cold beers and broke the spell. Terry was whining because we used up all the steaks and ruined his menu for the rest of the week. The beer was undoubtedly delicious. Woody and I decided that we wouldn't ask Terry what was going on with Dora. When he's ready, he'll tell us. Not long after Woody left, Luke stopped by just to let me know that Mrs. Freeze was in a great mood that morning. She caught some fish, but didn't seem upset about it. As he left, he smiled at me and winked. I wasn't sure what that meant. Amanda Freeze always sat alone during meals. I tried to avoid casual contact with guests, but tonight I decided to visit the mysterious woman. In fact, she wasn't that mysterious anymore, just interesting. May I join you? Certainly, I haven't ordered yet. You didn't go out anywhere this afternoon. No, I wanted to talk to Caitlin. I should have asked her father for permission first, but I hoped it would go smoothly. How did you do it? Not too good, I'm afraid. I couldn't explain everything as well as I should have. I just hope I didn't ruin it too much. Dora interrupted the conversation to take our dinner order. We chose one of three entries and the rest was prepared in advance. Terry knew how to simplify things. What exactly were you trying to do? I told you last night that I have a son. You mentioned this but did not elaborate. Jason is very smart, looks good, and is physically healthy, but he has one problem. Since childhood, 
he was mentally abused by his father. Although he always succeeded in everything he did, his father was never satisfied. The constant bullying and belittling robbed him of his self-respect and confidence. He stutters and avoids contact with other people, whether adults or people his age. I suppose that was the reason for the divorce? Absolutely. I also have a restraining order that prevents his father from contacting him even after he is of age. I have good lawyers. The conversation paused for a moment when Dora served us food. Luke said that Jason once came here to the hunting lodge with you. Yes. I hoped it would help him relax, but he hated the lake and fishing. Since then, whenever I come, he stays with my sister. Aren't you ashamed to leave him alone? Yes, but I think it is necessary. I don't want him to depend on me. At some point, he will have to be on his own. Each time I try to stay away a little longer to prepare for it. Unfortunately, leaving him with my sister doesn't help much. I think I see where this is going, but why Caitlin? She's the same age as Jason. She seems balanced and confident. She works hard. Other than that, I don't know much about her. She is attractive and people seem to feel comfortable around her. What exactly did you expect her to do for you, or should I say for Jason? All I wanted her to do was spend some one-on-one -on -one time with him. I was hoping that I could bring him here for a few weeks and maybe he would open up a little. He is scheduled to attend Princeton in six weeks. In his current condition, he will not be able to go. I have spent thousands of dollars on professional therapists and it was all wasted. That's probably too much to expect in two weeks. I have to try something. I noticed that Caitlin didn't seem too happy. She promised to think about it, but I'm afraid it doesn't look too promising. Would you like to talk to Woody? I was hoping you could do this for me. Why me? I'm good at reading people. Unfortunately, I allowed my father to choose my husband. I will never make this mistake again. I'll see what I can do. Will you have dessert? I will do so if you join me. I found Caitlin and Woody on the porch. It was cool, but beautiful. Can I interrupt? Certainly. Caitlin and I were waiting for you to come out. How was your dinner? Interesting. Your beautiful daughter was the topic of our dinner discussion. This is what we hoped for. Uncle John, she made me angry. I can't tell if she wants me to be a nanny for the children or an easy woman. I wasn't actually her uncle, but she got used to calling me that many years ago, and it seemed to stick. There is a big difference between these two options. Well, I'm not happy with any of the options. Is that how she presented it to you, or did you come to this conclusion yourself? Caitlin waited a moment before answering. No, I just assumed that this was what she was getting at. Either way, I have no intention of spending my time with a moron. Wow, baby. Poor choice of words. Woody seemed a little annoyed at his daughter's insensitivity. Well, I don't know how else to describe it. Mrs. Freeze tried to explain what was wrong with him, but I really wasn't paying attention. My thoughts were racing from side to side. Caitlin, he's going to Princeton in a couple of months. He is not stupid or mentally retarded. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, he's pretty darn smart. Woody and I watched his daughter pace back and forth on the porch. No, it's still wrong. She offers me money to take care of her son. I'm not a nanny, and I don't... She stopped mid-sentence. I am not an easily accessible woman. You don't pay someone to spend time with someone like that. I smiled at her audacity. I have a simple solution. Why don't you tell her that you will do whatever she wants for free? This way your reputation will remain untarnished. What is your reputation? I don't care what other people think. I have to come to terms with myself. Woody laughed quietly at his daughter's attempt to act like an adult. What she said made sense, but it took too long. How can I do my job and watch him at the same time? Dora can take on all your kitchen and dining room duties, and Jason can help you with the housework in the morning. Thus, the second half of the day remains free. What should I do with him then? Run naked through the forest and make love. Woody tried, but couldn't keep a straight face. It was a stupid way to tease his own daughter, but she was open to it and he just couldn't resist. Damn it, Dad, stop it. This is serious, and you and John are turning it into some kind of joke. Caitlin plopped down on the bench between us. Okay, I'll do it. 
but only for two weeks, Woody hugged her. I'm not sure why, but I think he was proud of the decision she made. We all stood up and headed back to the house. Dad, why can't I get into Princeton? Woody just groaned and slapped her ass. Later that evening, Amanda and I were having coffee in front of the fireplace. She seemed pleased with how things were going and decided to extend her stay at the lodge so she could be there at the same time as her son. She seemed a little upset when I expressed my disapproval of her idea. However, we came to a compromise. I promised to entertain her if she promised to leave Caitlin and Jason alone. She thought the idea was funny and wanted to know exactly what I meant. I still haven't had a chance to talk to Terry or Dora about why she was at the lodge. It could wait until they were ready. After I went to bed, I couldn't sleep. One thing kept going over and over in my head. Why didn't Loretta try to take some of the money that was in the bank? Why did she pay so quickly? What was it? What didn't I know? Amanda was already on the water when I came down for breakfast. Woody and I ate blueberry pancakes but didn't waste time on frivolous conversations. He had two outboard motors to repair and I had bills to pay. I waited until late morning to call Seymour. I had this damn itch that needed scratching. John, I was just as worried as you, but I didn't want to muddy the waters. I decided that getting Loretta to sign the papers was the most important thing. However, I brought one of my girls into the problem. Was that a problem or something else? Do you remember when Loretta's father died? Yes. This was about six years ago. It was quite sad because she lost both her parents within two years. Loretta's father had a life insurance policy for $100,000. Did you know about this? She didn't mention a damn thing about it. Loretta transferred the insurance to a money market account at Berkshire Credit Union under her maiden name. You're kidding, right? Why the hell would she do this? John, we'll probably never know unless she decides to tell you. I assumed she didn't want to try to get any of your marital property because she didn't want to risk losing her insurance money. Ray Upright didn't even come to town until last year, so he had nothing to do with it. No, but this raises another interesting point. Mr. Upright has a wife and two children in Colorado Springs. As far as we could determine, Loretta was unaware of this. I couldn't help it. I started laughing on the phone. I'm sorry, Seymour, but this is damn funny. She gave up everything for a man who was married and didn't even know it? It looks like it is, and it's only getting worse. How is this possible? Yesterday she cashed the account and left with a check for $124,000. Looks like she's going to leave town. All we can do is wait and see. At least you're out of danger. I hung up and was sitting quietly chuckling to myself when Dora came in. John, I just wanted to thank you for talking to Terry. I really appreciate it. She looked at her feet while she spoke. Everything is fine? Almost so. It's not the same as it was, but it's much better than it could have been. Dora, I think he really loves you. I'm glad things are back to normal. There was a short pause, and then she looked up. Everything is fine, John, but not back to normal. Maybe after a while, but not now. I can wait. What does it mean? Her eyes began to water a little. It was not my intention to cause her any distress, so I decided to change the subject. She started to turn and walk away, but stopped. He doesn't kiss me, John. My husband refuses to kiss me. We do everything else, but he can't bring himself to touch my lips with his. It hurts, but I think I deserve it. She sobbed quietly as she left the office. I didn't know what to say. Jason Freese arrived shortly after lunch. He was good-looking and carried himself well. You would have a hard time believing that he was as socially inept as his mother indicated. Caitlin noticed him as soon as he entered the cabin, and a wide smile immediately appeared on her face. I don't think he was what she expected. The next two weeks promised to be interesting. Amanda made me go fishing with her several times. I didn't mind fishing for perch or xander, but I found pike fishing boring. I think part of it was because I couldn't tell the difference between hooking and hanging on the weeds. Luke found it all funny, although he did his best to control himself. Eventually, she stopped forcing me to go out to the lake with her if I agreed to go for nature walks during the day. Terry and Woody were happy with how things were going. 
the three of us often got together to discuss business. Terry never talked about his relationship with Dora. Woody and I tactfully did not raise this topic. Of course, we all watched Caitlin and Jason. At first, everything went slowly, but on the second day, it picked up speed. Woody and I finally cornered her and forced her to tell us what was going on. I don't think the problem is as serious as Mrs. Freeze makes it out to be. Why is this so? He's just very shy, and it's mainly because of his stutter. He can't speak properly at all, and because of this, he avoids other people, especially girls, at all costs. I think he must have been teased a lot when he was younger. He seems comfortable with you. Not at first, Dad. It's getting better now, but I think it may take more than two weeks. Woody started laughing. You mean you want it to take longer than two weeks? I did not say that. Don't make things up. John, I think my daughter has gotten herself a boyfriend. What do you think I should do about this? We should think about a companion. It was a weak attempt to tease her, but she responded. Stop it now. He'll only be here for a few weeks and then I'll never see him again. He's a good guy, and I don't understand what all the fuss is about. Does he have a girlfriend? Uncle John, it doesn't matter, but the answer is no. I don't think he's ever gone on a date, because his father beat him mentally and his mother protected him. He didn't stand a chance. Have you kissed him yet? No, Dad, I didn't kiss him and I'm not going to do it. Maybe you can leave this? We are fine. Stop trying to ruin everything. With this short lecture, she left the room. Woody and I looked at each other and smiled. That evening, Amanda and I had dinner together. She seemed pleased with how Caitlin and Jason got along. I think she realized that part of his problem was that she was playing the mother hen role. It was nice to see that she was preparing to let him go alone. She also teased me for not keeping my end of our agreement. I promised to keep her busy, and she felt that I was not doing enough to fulfill this promise. Things were going smoothly at the lodge. The guests were happy, and we actually made a profit. It was small, but it was a profit. We contacted several ice hut operators in the area. They were more than willing to put as many facilities on the lake at the lodge as we could accommodate. We could only run them for about ten weeks, but that would fill another period of inactivity. There were several bird-watching organizations in the area. This gave us another opportunity to fill the slow few months of spring. We had enough property and surrounding public land to create several birding trails. We were hesitant to invite guests to wander through the woods during the fall hunting season, so we decided that fall would be the best time to maintain the entire property. I spent every evening with Amanda. It became natural and comfortable for both of us. It was almost ten days after Jason's arrival that Woody and I experienced a bit of a shock. Caitlin met with Amanda to update her on the progress she had made with Jason. According to Amanda, things were going much better than she ever expected. They talked for about an hour, and then Woody's little daughter calmly asked Amanda if she could get her some pills. This was something Mrs. Freeze didn't expect. Without hesitation, she agreed to do it. After Caitlin walked away smiling, Amanda changed her mind. That's where Woody and I came in. Amanda had no problem complying with Caitlin's request, but she wouldn't consider it without Woody's approval. This is something a father should not have to deal with. Mothers were put on this earth to take care of situations like these. Amanda and I tried our best to ease Woody's anxiety about this request. Reluctantly, he finally agreed that it was for the best. It turns out Caitlin handled Jason better than any of us expected. The next morning, I received a phone call from Loretta out of the blue. John, I need a little help. When I signed the divorce papers, I didn't ask for anything. Well, you know, in terms of money. Yes, I know. Well, I'm in a bind right now, and I was wondering if you could spare a few thousand dollars to help me out. It was obvious that something had happened over the past few days. Something bad for my future ex-wife. I don't understand. I thought you had a lot of money. What do you mean, John? I didn't take anything from you or from your accounts. No, I meant your father's insurance. There should have been enough in there to last you a long time. There was a pause on the other end of the line. John, did you know about insurance? Certainly, I'm not that stupid. 
What happened to all that cash from the account? Oh my God, John, I feel so ashamed. I did a stupid, very stupid thing. How stupid, Loretta? Raymond and I opened a joint bank account using a cashier's check I received from the credit union. Let me guess, Raymond has skipped town and the bank account is empty. Yes, yes, and I don't know what to do. John, I need your help. Are you going to go and return the money? What do you mean? Where do you go? I have no idea where he is or where he might go. I'm guessing he's on his way to Colorado Springs to see his wife and kids. A long silence followed. He is married? Yes, and he has two children. Why didn't you tell me? If you knew that, you should have fucking told me, John. Sorry, dear. I got the distinct impression that you wanted me out of your life. Now I could tell she was crying. It's time to stop the torture. Loretta, come see Seymour tomorrow. I'll call him and tell him to give you $5,000. This should last for a while, at least until you can get to Colorado and find a lawyer there to help you. John? Yes? Thank you. That was the last time I spoke to Loretta. I think a lot of guys would say that I shouldn't have given her anything. This was my first instinct. She screwed up so badly that I just couldn't help but feel a little sorry for her. Jason had been staying at the lodge for over a month. Soon it would be time for him to leave. Caitlin spent all her time with him and avoided Woody and me. We started joking about this. It was as if she was preparing him for his debut in our group lodge. We were all briefly introduced to each other, but none of us except Caitlin spent any time with him at all. At one end of the main hall, there was a small library and reading room. One afternoon, Woody and I noticed that Caitlin and Jason were there with Amanda Freese. This was not a random gathering. In fact, it looked like a formal meeting. Caitlin and Jason were both dressed smartly compared to their usual clothes. Amanda noticed Woody and I watching them and gave us a small smile. After about an hour, the children got up and headed towards us. They both had big smiles on their faces. Now it's your turn, Daddy. Mrs. Freeze wants to talk to you and Uncle John. Woody and I walked in like two kids sent off to meet the principal. It turned out that Amanda Freeze had more money than Woody and I could have ever imagined. We knew she had money, but we never imagined that she was filthy rich. Amanda's father donated a lot of money to his old university, Princeton, so much that Amanda could very well get whatever she wanted from them. The only thing left to do now was to get Elwood F. Perry's approval for his daughter to attend Princeton in less than two weeks. As far as Woody was concerned, it wasn't difficult. Terry later joined the two of us on the porch. It was too cold for beer, but we drank it anyway. We were trying to figure out if Caitlin really liked Jason or if she was just pretending to get a free ride to college. We didn't spend too much time on it. Terry still didn't talk about Dora. Woody and I knew that this topic would never, ever be discussed. Later that evening, Amanda joined me in front of the fireplace with popcorn. Popcorn tasted better in the microwave, but popping it in the fireplace was more fun. I liked the burnt, crispy grains better. I've never thought it appropriate to drink wine with popcorn, but tonight seemed special to me. This was the first night in a long time that I didn't sleep alone. We thought we were keeping a low profile, but we forgot that Caitlin was the one who made the beds in the morning. Unassembled Amanda's bed did not go unnoticed. Amanda and I endured Caitlin's barbs at breakfast. Later that morning, Amanda moved her things into my room. Jason, who was usually very quiet and reserved, winked at me during lunch. I assumed I had his approval. WeatherGuard Recovery Enterprises agreed to repair the destroyed house for $14,000 plus 5% of the resale profit. They specialized in repairing buildings damaged by storms and fires. The entire agreement was taken care of online. I never saw the old house again and ended up making a profit of over $60,000. Sarah called to tell me that her mother had managed to get back almost all the money that Raymond had taken from her. Loretta left Colorado for Los Angeles. She planned to stay with her cousin who lived there. Amanda went with Jason and Caitlin to help them get settled into school. They had spent the last two weeks at the lodge renting a cabin, so Woody had no problem agreeing to let them share the apartment while they attended school. He realized 
that if he tried to do anything else, he would simply disappoint himself. Before returning, Amanda stopped at her home in Burlington to pick up clothes and personal items she would need at the lodge. We all welcomed her decision to stay forever, especially Dora, who was dying to be in the company of women. Amanda was going to handle all the advertising and correspondence, two tasks I did but never enjoyed. To Luke's dismay, Amanda stopped fishing for pike. Her obsession seemed to have passed. Things slowed down in late fall, as we were one of the few places in the area without hunters. This gave us time to catch up and get things in order. Money was not a problem. We had a small Christmas party with a tree and a few gifts. Amanda hung up some mistletoe, and Dora was delighted when her husband kissed her for the first time. After that, everything seemed to return to normal. Poor Woody was the only one spending the holidays alone, but he didn't seem to mind too much. He never heard from Colleen again. Although my divorce was finalized, Amanda and I never discussed marriage. Everything was fine the way it was, and none of us wanted to ruin everything. Jason and Caitlin did not finish their first year at Princeton. After a hasty marriage in Maryland, Jason transferred to the University of Vermont, and the two lovebirds moved into the Burlington family home. Amanda was delighted with her first grandchild. I guess her pills didn't work. Yes, it was childish, but it was one hell of a ride and a lot of fun. I would do it again. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.